Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Investor Financing Podcast. And today's show is going to be really good because we're going to talk to a lender uh, specifically about small balance agency debt, Fannie and Freddie. We're going to kind of deep dive, and I'm going to ask all the questions that I know the listeners and, and viewers are going to want to know uh, so we can uh, best learn how to use agency debt in our growing real estate business. So please welcome Matt Frank. He's an associate director at Lumet, responsible for the origination and structuring of commercial mortgage loans in Arizona and the Southwest. He specializes in Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae small balance loans. Matt has more than 15 years of commercial real estate experience prior to joining Lumet uh, legacy firm, uh, Hunt Real Estate Capital in 2017. He was a commercial loan officer with Alaska USA Federal Credit Union where he opened the Phoenix market for the firm and helped grow their portfolio to hundred million in less than two years. Uh, he previously held commercial banking positions with Unison Bank and Union Bank. All right, well, welcome to the show, Matt. And uh, I'm super excited to ask you a bunch of questions so I can get a better uh, understanding of the, the, all the things I don't know. Uh, as many of my clients on the, on the, on the broker side, um, they're, they ask me a lot of questions and, and we're always figuring out how to size up these deals the right way. So I'm going to, I have a series of questions already queued for you, but welcome to the show and uh, thanks for joining us. Good deal. Good to be here. All right. So, so um, let's just kind of take like uh, a deep dive in into a uh, small balance agency. And is that typically seven and a half million and less uh, loan balance? Correct. Consider? On the Freddie side, it is a million to seven and a half. And on the Fannie side, it is a million to six million. Okay, very good. Um, what what do you what's the main difference between uh, Freddie and Fannie as far as like underwriting? Why would you size up a loan to Freddie versus Fannie? So the main difference between the two programs is Freddie performs better in the larger markets. And Fannie performs a little bit better in the smaller markets because you're not restricted. Freddie will shrink you down uh, in a small, very small market to 70% LTV and a 140 debt cover, whereas Fannie will still allow you to go to 80 and 125. Interesting. So who's more liberal in their underwriting guidelines in, 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 in whole, uh, in theory? Like when you first look at a deal to size up, I mean, your first you're looking at is, is it a major MSA or is it a tertiary market? Can you kind of tell us how, like when you get a, a, a T12, a rent roll, and maybe the offering memorandum on the property, what goes on in your mind to size up the deal and figure out, okay, this is going to be a Freddie or this is going to be a Fannie? Well, it would, the, one of the major factors is if it's a mobile home park, it's got to go Fannie, can't go Freddie. So <clears throat> if you're looking at a multifamily property, you know, he can price it both ways and see who has the better pricing. Their, their underwriting standards are virtually the same. Um, you know, they're almost exactly alike, except for the fact that the differentiator is, is, is the market size. Got it. Got it. So you'll, you'll know pretty quickly, okay, it's a tertiary market, very small population Correct. count. Correct. We're, most likely that's going to go fanny. Yes. Okay, that, that's interesting. Now, when we talk about qualifications of the sponsorship team, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but net worth between this, the general partners uh, uh, needs to be equal to or greater than the loan balance. Uh, that's they, correct. They need 10% post-close liquidity between the sponsorship team. Correct. Um, they need to have experience with a similar uh, type property uh, meaning if you're buying a hundred unit multifamily, uh, they would like to see that you own, you know, 30, 40, something, 50 unit. Correct. Something close in, in size. Okay. They don't want to see that somebody going from call it a 15 to 20 unit building to a hundred unit building. It's, they will have some leniency if they live in the market within a hundred miles. But if you're say you're an investor in, Salt Lake City, and you're buying an 80 unit deal for the first time in Tucson, it's not probably not going to be that easy to get it across the finish line. Yeah. Unless and, you and, have somebody that's local in the market that is part of your, your, your partnership. So when you're, when you're, uh, if you're the sponsor 
and you're investing in emerging markets, the key then is to add to the credibility of the file is to have a third party property management company that runs and, uh, and manages asset classes in that location or pr proximity to, Correct. if not, it's going to be a tough deal to sell that, you know, this is my, um, I have not a not always, not always, but it, it definitely does. It may, there's more going to be more hoops you got to jump through. And it's just like anything in life, right? There's compensating factors that they'll look at, like the sponsor's net worth, uh, if they own other commercial assets, they, they'll take that into consideration if if they're buying something and they're going to self-manage potentially, um, I guess, just like in any kind of uh, lending situation. Um, now at Lumit, do you, do you do bridge to agency debt there? Do you have a, a, a bridge team as well? I do. I cover the conventional side for Fannie and Freddie and bridge and the construction piece as well. So, so you guys also do ground up as well? We do ground up construction from 20 to 50 million. Okay. And that's, uh, I, I, Lumen is a direct HUD lender too, but you're just talking about conventional ground up construction. Correct. Okay. Correct. Cause you handle Correct. everything yep. conventional. What's the, what's the, other than loan size, what's the real big difference between small balance versus, um, regular or conventional agency debt? There's not a whole lot. Um, you know, the underwriting standards are virtually the same. The liquidity and, and net worth uh, are about the same. The, and actually now between Fannie, well, Fannie just made a change where they have one grid. They used to have a small balance grid and a conventional grid. Now they have one grid for both programs. So rates are virtually the same. They did up the ante a little bit. If you're under $2 million, it, there's an adder to the rate, but it's not that big of a difference, but that's the only caveat. And, you know, once again, Fannie and Freddie, Freddie's gotten really competitive on the conventional side, whereas I would say on an annual basis, we probably did 70, 80% Fannie, 20, 30% Freddie. Last year, I want to say it was almost 50-50. Freddie got really, really, really into getting our business last year and got really competitive rate wise. And how aggressive on your construction lending uh, for multifamily do you guys get as far as loan to cost? I mean, I, I get it. It's got to depend on the sponsorships experience and yep. so forth. But is that something you'll do 80% of costs? It's actually 70% okay. uh, plus or minus five, depending on the developer's experience in the market. And that's... that's um, you, Lumens funds essentially. They 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 right. have a bridge department. you you have your your agency licenses. And as far as agency licenses, there's like only maybe like twenty something uh, licensed uh, agency lenders. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's twenty just yet, but it's getting close. They seem to add a few a, a couple of year a couple of year. But there's also in the last three to four years, there's been some that have gotten a license and then lost the license. So I would say it's probably somewhere in that realm at this point. Yeah, I, I, I was stressing that to the viewers because there's very few li licensed agency lenders, right? And, and essentially right. <clears throat> brokers like myself would bring a deal to, to yourself, to your company to fund this. So there's it's not like, like a hard money bridge fund where there's a million of them, right? There's very limited agency lenders is, is why I Correct. was stressing that point. So after you get a file in, uh, it looks good. Um, how do you work with like a regional, like Freddie or Finney office? How does that like look to like, if you have questions to see if they're going to sign off on and so forth, what's that process? If there's any kind of like overlays or kind of sticky factors or hairy factors of the deal? No, it's just a matter of knowing who your contact is, say in the Midwest, you know, or the West or the East Coast, and, you know, addressing any issues that you see with the file with them. A lot of times we'll pre-screen a deal uh, if we think that there may be some issues with, with one of the reps, and they'll give us the ins and the outs, or they'll go look at the property, you know, via Google Maps and say, hey, we like the collateral. We have questions about this part of the collateral. 
you know, it looks like it's it's got some easements or something going on so that we dig into the file. We don't we don't want to take somebody's money in and start spending money if we can identify a problem on the front end. Right now, um, are we still collecting for reserves for COVID or has that lapsed now? They are all gone. Thank okay. you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so they're all gone now, everybody. So that's good. Um, and on a cash out refinance, if it's, you know, are we looking at 80% leverage in a larger MSA or you, you capped at 75 on small balance? probably going to be 75 at this point. You can yeah. get acquisition financing at 80, uh, but you're probably still going to get reduced maybe 5% on a, on a refi. On small balance agency debt, how do you look at, uh, like if there's a, a CapEx budget that's not significant where you would maybe go bridge first? How do, how, how do, how do you underwrite, you know, in general, what would that look like? If they didn't want to do bridge to, to agency debt. So on a small balance bridge under 5 million, we don't have a program. We, they would have to go elsewhere and then we would take that bridge out. Uh, 5 million and up, we would just do it, you know, one to three years. Typically on our bridge, we would do up to 80% uh, loan to cost or loan to value and 100% loan to cost. So it just would depend on the going in cap. There's Various factors going in cap rate, the the current uh, debt coverage ratio, um, and how much you know they're putting into the deal, and what the exit cap would be. Um, here specifically in the Arizona market, we're starting to see going in cap rates on conventional conventional deals, meaning up, up more than seven and a half million at a two and a half cap, <laughs> and the stabilized at four and a half. So uh, people's eyeballs are getting a little bit bigger um, looking at that. So if I heard you correct, you bridge deals have to be 5 million plus loan amount. Correct. Okay, so you're not doing small bridge deals like one to- we, Yeah, we don't have a small bridge. I yeah. wish we had a small bridge, but we do not. And if it's the right deal, the right sponsorship, you could do, um, it sounds like 80 up to 80% of the purchase price and 100% of CapEx, is that? Correct. Okay. Uh, depending on the debt service coverage ratio, debt yield, and, and, and your underwriting uh, formula. You, you got it. You got it. They're going to underwrite it to an agency takeout. So uh, it's always going to be the, the, the agency metrics that we're going to be looking for on the takeout. So the sponsors have to be qualified, meaning uh, net worth and everything. They can't, you, you could maybe squeeze stretch it a little bit because now they have this asset but it's going to be Correct. a little bit more liberal but it's still uh, 12 months for 24 months from now they still they got to be able to, to underwrite to the standard so um got it so with the market being the way it is what is your firm looking at uh are you guys still super aggressive is is is, is fanny and freddie pulling back a little bit right now at this point because the market's just been so crazy no, they're still very bullish on the West Coast, you know, for sure. Um, they haven't made any changes to, like, Fannie has a pre-review market. They haven't made any changes yet this year. They typically will maybe move some, some cities out of a pre-review or some cities into a pre-review. And that's just based on the migration of what's going on in that state or that, or that city. Um, but they have not done, they've not made any changes as of yet this year. Just out of curiosity, because I get a lot of calls on on uh, mobile home parks. Um, a big caveat there is if the um, if you're acquiring a property and a lot of the uh, pat there a lot of coaches are owned, right? Like, right. It, it, that's a no no with Fannie, right? What what what's their threshold there? Thirty five percent can be park owned. And if they are, if it's that high, then they want them to come up with a game plan of how to sell those coaches to the to the homeowners so that they can reduce that 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 leverage down. You're listening to the Investor Financing Podcast. We'll be right back after this break. 
Are you looking for funding? Are you getting frustrated trying to find a lender? Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and click the Get Funding button. Complete the simple form and schedule a free phone consultation with one of our placement specialists. We have a proprietary directory of funding partners that can help you get the funding you need. It's fast and easy to explore the options available for your specific needs. Don't wait. Visit InvestorFinancingPodcast.com and get connected. Now, going back to uh, agency um, prepayment penalties, yield maintenance, do you, um, can you talk uh, on the subject of a step down versus yield maintenance? You're going to get a better rate, uh, better rate with yield maintenance, right? Uh, essentially versus to the step down but how does yield maintenance throws a lot of people off because it's like how do i even calculate what that penalty is going to be yeah the so so i get this question all the time the the best way to explain the yield maintenance calculation is to assume that if you do a 10-year fixed that you are responsible for the interest on that loan for all 10 years uh, it, obviously, there are some metrics that change as the 10 year note goes up. The prepayment is a little bit less, but just, I mean, I had a borrower email you, me yesterday about that. How do I calculate it? And I said, well, you contact servicing, they can get you the exact amount, but just take into account that you're three years into the loan, you got seven years left, that you're responsible for, the, for those seven years of interest. And so then it, it, some people, um, opt in to go the step down because they're thinking that they are going to refinance. Is that why you would usually opt into a step down prepay? You're going to pay a little bit higher interest rate, but you, if you're going to refi, if you're going to sell or refi year three or four, you're not going to get caught up in. Yeah, the you know, the, I I always try to push people towards the step down because then they know exactly what their prepay is. There are I have borrowers that say, Matt, I don't care. I'm not selling the property. I want the yield maintenance. I'm not going to refinance the property. 10 years go by at a snap of my finger. But then I have borrowers that tell me, you know, hey, I'm not selling the property. And then two years later, they say, hey, I've got, you know, an offer on the property that's $2 million over what I paid for it. What's my prepayment? Well, your prepayment's $700,000. <laughs> so, you know, the, I guess the way that I look at it is, yeah, you do get, you know, a, a discount for taking the yield maintenance. But if you want to refinance and pull cash out and move on to a, another property or sell your property, you know, on a 10 year fixed, if you're four years into it, you know that you're five, five, four, four, three, three. So you're three, you're three percent. And, you know, you can calculate that right off of whatever your whatever your unpaid principal balance is. So you know exactly what your prepay is. Whereas you know, it's a guessing game on the yield maintenance. So we, um, so the options for for terms is a is a five year, seven, and a ten year uh, amortization over thirty. But we also have like the and and can you kind of dive into the uh, the Freddie Floater program? I don't know if, if sure. So yeah. yeah, it's 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 called the hybrid program, and it's basically five years fixed. It's a 20 year note on a 30 year amortization. So you, for, if you do a five year, you're floating for 15. If you do seven, you're floating for 13, 10, you're floating for 10. And then the note comes due in, in year 20. So it, it, it adjusts at 1% per year. Uh, your floor is going to be your start rate. And you know the max over the life of the loan is typically about, it's like 11.5%, call it. But the prepay is more liberal on that one, or something. Yeah, is that is that? I'm I'm trying to cue why an investor would would go with it because I knew for like a year ago it seemed like it was a hot product. But what? Why would an investor want to go into a Freddie floater? So a couple reasons. One is they don't like the idea of a balloon at the end of the note. So this gives them the ability to float and see what the market is. So if the market is gone down, then they can refinance. And that, that 1% during the floating period is waived. If it's gone up, but their rate is roughly close to what their note rate was, then they can just sit there and let it float until rates get too high and then they can lock in something else. 
So that's the main reason why they do that is, you know, they, they don't want to have to refinance. They don't want to be forced to refinance at the end of the fixed period. And they, you know, it gives them a little bit more latitude. And on a value add play, we're going, let's say it's a, a $10 million acquisition. Um, and it's got a decent CapEx bu uh, budget. Um, are you guys underwriting those ridge loans for like a 24 month or 12 month term with extensions? How do you, how do you? So it can be six to 36 months okay. with, with two one year extensions after that, if need be. And usually those are IO uh, for the yeah, whole term? Yeah, it's all IO, correct. And how do you guys determine um, rates on bridge debt? Is it, are you guys, is it usually like Wall Street Journal Prime over? It's going to be SOFR plus the spread. Most of the bridge debt's coming in somewhere between three and a half percent and four percent all in. So, you know, uh, I don't know what the SOFR's sitting at today, but, you know, I'd say that's three, roughly 350 over, you know, maybe 400 over. So the bridge that you really do is is kind of like what I would call a bridge. It's it's for for people that are in the business doing bigger deals, um, not the kind of uh, really kind of hairy deals, but just more um, kind of the a a type of borrowers. They have experience, they have the net worth, they can underwrite uh, to Fannie and Freddie standards. Okay, so I got Correct. that. Um, and so what? Are you are you seeing um, it when you do bridge to agency? Is there any um, do you waive fees when they roll into your your program? I mean, is that the obviously the idea is that they're going to stick with you, right? Correct. So, so there's probably a penalty if they go somewhere else or do something else. Yeah. So it's one percent in and 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 one percent exit, um, and that's both for the construction and for the bridge. Uh, but as long as they stay with us and allow, allow us to do the permanent, we waive the exit. And, and where do you think your, uh, your lending institution's competitive advantage is in, in, in the whole lending business is that you can do the bridge agency? Uh, what, what, what would be the, your kind of your selling feature, would you say? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, we're, 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 we're definitely aggressive. We will, on especially on the smaller deals, on, you know, the million dollar deals, a lot of the agency lenders won't do, you know, just a million dollar agency loan. They, they, they'd they rather be two and a half and up. So, you know, we, we win business that way. We win business because we have the bridge, you know, and we have the construction program. So we can handle everything for a borrower in-house. Um, but I would say that, you know, Lumen as a whole is, is we, we, we're not going to lose business because of fees. <laughs> I would say that. Got it. So you guys are competitive and you have good originators and uh, support staff and, and get things done. And so that's why people come back. Correct. Um, and so... Um, so you you're you're located in Arizona, but you 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 can let you you mostly focus uh, in your market in the southwest. But you people can come to you at, you know all over, or do you have team members that would handle different transactions? No, correct. I, my focus is mainly in the southwest, but you know that's not to say that I don't do deals in Florida or Ohio or wherever it happens to be, because I do have investors that own you know they own property here, but they own property all over. The all over the country. So yeah, I can handle deals anywhere in the US. Where are you seeing a lot of deal flow right now for uh, on the acquisition side? Just what markets well, are, are you seeing a lot of deals? So I would say the hottest markets are Phoenix, Tucson, Salt Lake, Austin, uh, San Antonio seems to be picking up some steam. Um, there's been a lot of activity in Albuquerque lately. Um, you know, it's been a market that people have kind of overlooked over the years, but I think that, that people are starting to see value there. Um, and it's a stable market. Uh, but I would say those are the markets that I'm seeing a lot of the activity. in. Very good. And let's kind of like kind of circle back as we're kind of winding down because I asked you a lot of good questions, but uh, let's hone in on um, tips and tricks that could help a sponsor Maybe they, I have a lot of sponsors that are like in-betweeners, I'd say like 
they are emerging. They're, they've got a good amount of units under management, but they've never done any agency debt. And that they're now at the point of doing agency debt um, or getting close to it, or even for people that do a lot of agency debt. Can you kind of walk through like what makes it easy for you to size up a deal quickly? What do you want to see? How do you want it laid out? And kind of dive in there because I think that's extremely useful for, for people watching this. So I, I tell everybody the easiest thing is have a clean rent roll with the unit mix, the unit sizes on it, um, and, a, and a T12 broken out. To do an, an initial, initial look at the deal, that's all that I need. And then we can dive into the borrower's experience and things like that. But to make, make sure that the deal even works is just a clean rent roll with the unit mix, unit sizes, and a, and a T12 uh, is, is really all, all we need. Got it. And t tell us about a deal that you've done uh, that was complicated and, and um, maybe some, some things you've learned uh, to look for as a sponsor that might be looking at deals right now. Like, for example, if it's a cardinal property, right? Like uh, different things like that. A little couple, couple things you've run, in, run into and encountered that might help a listener that's you know, active in multifamily, uh, looking at a deal, um, make a better decision about buying so, or not buying it. I would say the thing that I'm running into the most commonly at this point isn't necessarily property. Well, it's property driven, but it's not driven by the property. It's driven by insurance. Insurance has gotten very expensive. So when we've been underwriting deals, Insurance seem over the last twelve months seems to be coming in higher than ever, every than any time we, we we've under, underwritten a deal. So I would say that that's caused complications for borrowers because obviously the higher the insurance, the less cash flow. So we got to lower the loan amount. Um, outside of that, what I also am seeing in the pipeline today, and it's not just necessarily me, but it's across the company, is it seems like there's a lot of deals that aren't agency ready. And I mean, what I mean by that is the quality and condition of the property. Uh, we recently, I recently looked at a deal in Ohio where I screened it with, with Freddie Mac. They looked at the quality on, on Google Maps. They liked the quality. They were, they were like, it's a great area. Well, guess what? The borrower hasn't put any money in the property. So when they went out to do the inspection, there was stuff exposed, stuff we didn't expect to find. But I also have noticed on our pipeline calls that even though we're kind of looking at these deals, when they go out to see the deals, that they're not in the condition that they need to be. So I would say that insurance is one, and then walk the deal before you get into it, because it seems like there's a lot of acquisitions that are having issues because the quality of the property isn't, isn't being kept up. Any acquisition, and this might be different for people that were buying smaller multifamily and using banks or credit unions, that uh, Fannie and Freddie, is, they're going to always get a property conditions report, right? Which Correct. Is, it's an inspection of the exterior and interior of some of the units, not all of them. But if you have deferred maintenance like wood rot and things like that, um, that's a big no-no. Um, I mean, what, what's kind of the threshold that you know, like, hey, this is going to be an issue. I know there's no one size fits all for this, but what's kind of your threshold of like knowing, hey, this is probably going to be an issue? So there, there's, there's, there's a couple of different categories. There's the life threatening that need to be done prior to close. There's the 90 day post close and then, you know, six months to 12. So it's going to be, you know, things that are, that are, that are life threatening to a tenant have to be remedied immediately. Things like wood rot and things like that can be pushed probably out 12 months, depending on how much it is. If it's 10% of the loan amount, they're probably going to do a hold back for it to make sure that the work gets done and then they can get reimbursed for it. So it's, it, it's, it varies from deal to deal. And I know like uh, Fannie and Freddie, they're, they're pretty serious because I've had a couple uh, sponsors that for whatever reason, they acquired a property and all of a sudden, of course, occupancy dropped significantly there's triggers that Fannie and Freddie do right and and if they see that they're gonna they're, they're gonna send an inspector sometimes and figure out to go see what's going on why is there such an occupancy drop uh and I see that can be an issue for some sponsors sometimes that they 
they get these properties and you know they they underwrote it at 90% or 93% occupancy and all of a sudden you know the the new sponsor takes it over and occupancy levels drop significant significantly and Finney and Freddie can be very it seems like very firm and like you have to fix those problems or else they're going to accelerate the loan yeah i would agree with that i, I would say that the one caveat to that is they they're more lenient when you're sending in your reports on time and if your reports don't necessarily match up they 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 ask you why and they try try to figure out why the why why the occupancy's dropped if you're not sending in your reports on a timely manner then they're going to be a little bit more stringent with you and a little bit you know they they may accelerate the loan but I, I, I would say that if you work with them and you send in your 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 occupancy reports and your rent rolls and your 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 T12s in on time, they they definitely are more willing to work with you. It's when you when they feel like you're hiding something from them that they that that they don't like. And and what are the requirements? Is that a quarter quarterly thing or uh, is that they want quarterly reports typically? Yeah, quarterly to 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 biannually. It depends. Okay. Lastly, I think a lot of sponsors, like, like I just had a conversation with a gentleman today that he has all bank and credit union debt. He's like, I need to start doing agency debt because it's, you know, I'm getting more and more bigger loans and agency debt is non-recourse with standard bad boy, bad boy carve out. So I, I think that's um, why most sponsors, you know, that are doing these $100 million deals, these $50 million deals it's attractive to have non-recourse debt. I mean, it's not, um, but that's, that's that's why people achieve, go for agency debt other, and their rates in terms are usually better, superior to Yeah, I mean, everything. that's one reason. It's also that, you know, you're at a credit union or a bank, you're going to get capped out eventually, whether it be a 5 million cap, a 10 million cap or a 20 million cap. And you're going to have to have depository accounts. With the agencies, you can have an unlimited capital stack and you don't have to have a depository account. So that's, and it's non-recourse debt. So that's one of the, one of the, you know, many, many attractions that people have. Yeah, yeah, that's all the, and is there anything people need to know? I mean, obviously you're dealing with a lot of syndications probably, right? A lot of uh, these syndicators, they set up their private placement memorandums, do all that stuff. Um, but really at the end of the day, Fannie and Freddie, Credit unions and banks sometimes don't understand syndications where right. Fannie and Freddie are like, okay, this is what we see probably 60% All the time. of time. Right. <laughs> so, so other, is there anything needed to know um, in general about a syndication deal? No, they just want to know, they're going to want to know who the limited partners are and they're going to ask for a breakout of limited partners and what they're putting in. Um, but that's basically it with the agencies. I will say that for our bridge, they want to see the warm body guarantors, even though it's non-recourse debt, they want to see 5% coming in from the GP. Um, so, but on the Fannie Freddie side, they, they don't really care if you're syndicating the, you know, the down payment too. Uh, but for our bridge, they, they want to see 5%. Very good. Well, I asked you a lot of good questions. This has been a very informative uh, show, not only for myself, but the viewers that are going to get to watch us in the future. So Matt, I really appreciate you joining us. Hope to have you back on the show every few months to give us some updates on uh, agency debt, what's going on in the market, and um, hopefully some viewers reach out and get some big monstrous loans going soon. And uh, really appreciate your time. Good deal. I appreciate it. Thanks. All right. All right.